Let's continue our four and a half year verse by verse journey through all of God's inspired word by returning our attention to the story of the crucifixion. We know that Jesus was crucified between the two thugs mid-morning on the 14th day of the first Jewish month, the day on which the Passover lambs were being butchered for Passover celebration later in the afternoon and evening. We know that he had prayed for those that were doing the crucifixion, that Father would forgive them. We know that Jesus had been stripped of his own clothing, probably right down to his loincloth, and that the soldiers had divided that clothing amongst themselves and had even uh, gambled over it. We know that uh, he had turned responsibility over to his cousin, John, for the care of Mary, Jesus' mother. Uh, the responsibility of the firstborn son being kind of transferred across to a cousin. We also know that when Pilate had the accusation or the condemnation note added to the cross, that this caused great upset with the Jewish leadership because it just simply said in, in the three languages that would have been Uh, legible to the different three language groups of the area, uh, Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And the leadership of the Jewish people wanted it changed. They wanted it to say he claimed to be the King of the Jews. And Pilate, who had just had about enough of the Jewish leadership, I think, simply said, What I have written, I have written, meaning it's going to stand the way it says it right now, which is what prompted the leadership to make a show of mocking Jesus while he was upon the cross. And this is kind of where we wrapped up last week, and I want to start there again. Let's begin in the Luke 23, 35 passage, and then we'll also look at the parallels because there's enough distinction between them that I want to pull all of that in. So Luke 23, 35, the people stood by watching, but the rulers, note that, the rulers that had objected to the notation above his head, scoffed at him saying, he saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. So their their idea is, we need to point out that this guy is absolutely helpless. How could he possibly be a savior figure? Mark 15, which you remember is Peter's recollections. I don't know if Peter was right there at the cross by now. Uh, He may have uh, got this information from others like John who had been there. So Mark 15, 29, those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, ah, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. Now that, of course, is a reference to some of the false accusations that were made at the, um, the private hearing overnight uh, that Jesus had supposedly said he would destroy the building of the temple, which he didn't, uh, and then rebuild it. Now, verse 31, though, reminds us, so also the chief priests with the scribes. Chief priests might actually be Sadducees. Many of them were, uh, and they didn't have an interest in supernatural But the scribes most certainly did. They were always associated with the Pharisees. So they mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, see that's tying in with the wording over Jesus' head, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. So, of course, they are mocking the wording that's on the charge board 
uh, thinking that this would make up for what Pilate had done. And then Matthew 27, 39, similar. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, remember that this is another point that they hated Jesus over, is that he had a unique identity connection to the Father. He is the one-of-a-kind son, the monogenes son of God, and he made that claim, which they thought was blasphemy. So here they are mocking that as well. If you are the son of God, then come down from the cross. And uh, then it says, so also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying he, can, he saved others, he cannot save himself. Uh, he is the king of Israel, then let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. Of course, they don't expect him to come down from the cross, uh, so they are offering what they don't believe they'd ever have to pay up on. Uh, But of course, Jesus is not coming down from the cross. He is coming up from the grave, and then they will be required to either believe or not believe, and thereby either be saved by faith or condemned by their lack thereof. Uh, Verse number uh, 43, he trusts in God, let God deliver him now if he desires him, for he has said, I am the son of God, which is interesting because this wording here that they're actually using ends up being in Psalm 22, which we're going to go over in just a little bit. So I want you to keep that filed away. Now, verse 44 of Matthew 27 reports, and the robbers, uh, the the troublemakers, the uh, seditionists, the murderers uh, who were being crucified on his right and his left, who were crucified with him, also reviled him in the same way. So we are reminded that they are mocking him as well. Uh, Mark 15, 32 makes that point as well. And Luke uh, 23, uh, verse 36, uh, says that also the soldiers got involved in this mocking by the leadership. It says the soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. And so we've got All of this mockery that's taking place starting shortly after the crucifixion began, which was right around the middle of the morning. And then time passes until we reach midday. Uh, Matthew 27, 45 puts it this way. Now, From the sixth hour, that's midday in the way that Matthew records it, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour, and that would be mid-afternoon or about three o'clock. Same thing is reported in Mark 15, 33. When the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. So three hours of darkness. Now, I am not satisfied with the way most of the uh, video presentations of this event uh, are carried out because they often show an eclipse, which is absolutely impossible during Passover. Passover takes place at full moon time, And eclipses only take place 15 days earlier at new moon time. So this most certainly was not an eclipse of the sun. The other way that many of the TV or movies present it is some sort of storm front that rolls in, that covers the the sun uh, with clouds and maybe even brings a whole bunch of wind along with it. And... That is highly unlikely for this time of year. Uh, It is uh, clear, uh, typically weather-wise, during this time of year. 
uh, clear skies during the day, uh, no covering of the sun by storm clouds. Uh, besides which, I'm going to give you one other thing to chew on. I did my master's thesis on the dating of Jesus' crucifixion. And so I scoured a lot of the ancient records in order to see if any of them would tie into this story. And I ran across a record of a record. And I do acknowledge that it's not a primary source by itself. But it is a very ancient record of an ancient record. Uh, that is uh, from the area of Turkey, I believe, uh, the original record, uh, that said in this particular year, A.D. 33, it said that there was a darkening of the sun at midday and the stars came out. Now that tells me it is an exceptionally unusual darkening. Uh, because you don't see the stars during daylight hours. Uh, sometimes when an eclipse happens, you can see a few of the brighter stars, but the impression from the record is, is it became almost night with a clear sky and a clear view of all of the stars. And so I think that's exactly what was happening here uh, as reported uh, by the gospel writers, and that would have been terrifying. Nothing like this had ever happened in these people's lifetime, let alone in any of the stories they'd ever heard. And so they are scared to death for a good three hours. I also believe that this uh, helps explain the change of mindset of one of the thugs being crucified with Jesus. Because in Luke twenty-two thirty-nine, 39, it says this, One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. And so this, I believe, took place sometime after the darkening of the sun. Remember that in the first three hours, they'd been mocking him, both of them had been mocking him along with everybody else. But then suddenly here, one of them picks up that mocking again. And verse 40 says, but the other rebuked him saying, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. That's a confession, an acknowledgement that he had committed murder. He had committed some sort of seditious act that he'd been condemned for to death, and now he was suffering that penalty. Both of them were suffering that penalty. But, he continues, this man has done nothing wrong. So this, this second thug has come to the conclusion that Jesus is innocent. And perhaps because of the supernatural events happening around him, that Jesus is Messiah. Now, I think a lot of people have made the assumption that this guy had never had any type of contact with Jesus before. And I think that is a big jump because we know that he's Jewish, this, this guy that's hanging on the cross. We also know uh, that for the last several years, three years of Jesus' ministry, plus another in year and a half previous to that of John the Immerser's ministry, that the Jewish population had been just hammered on this idea that they needed to repent, that the kingdom was at hand. And this, this is reported that people came out in droves. Uh, the language, the idiomatic language is that everyone was coming out to John the Immerser everyone, and that Jesus then was even making more of an impact than John had been making. So it is very highly probable that this, this thug had been um, 
in contact with either John the Immerser's ministry or Jesus the Christ ministry, and had gone on with his life the way it was, got himself into this trouble, and now, with the supernatural events around him, he is responding with a form of repentance, because this is what it says next. Verse 42, he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So not only does this thug know about the coming kingdom of Jesus, he believes that Jesus is in fact the Messiah. And even though he is hanging here on the cross right now, that he will still ascend to the throne of Israel. That takes a lot of faith. And so Jesus says back to him, Amen, or truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradis. Paradis is a borrowed word, uh, but commonly understood in Jewish terms as meaning the place where the blessed dead await their resurrection. And then eventually, once they're resurrected, the place where they will spend eternity. And so Jesus was promising this man that he would be saved by his faith and that he would be with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the other blessed dead on the other side of death. And he would even be with Jesus on the other side of death. And so that is a great end to his story. And I wish the other thug had come to the same sort of repentance, even if it's coming here at the last moment of life. Uh, let's go back to uh, Mark first, Mark 15.33, where we are reminded again that when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. So three hours of darkness, and then the ninth hour is the hour of prayer. It is the second of two public gatherings at the temple for the offering of incense by the priest inside the shrine building and a prescribed prayer there and the offering of a sacrifice on behalf of all Israel uh, in, the, in the forecourt, out in front, uh, and uh, part of the prayer time. This is the hour of prayer. So mid-afternoon. The first one was mid-morning. So Jesus was crucified at the exact same time that the morning prayer service happened. And now he is coming to the end of his life at the exact same time that the afternoon worship and prayer service is taking place. So verse 34, at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice. Uh, Mark's account apparently uses uh, some Aramaic uh, pronunciation here. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Uh, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In the Matthew account, uh, we see the same wording, just with the more Hebrew pronunciation. Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani. Uh, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And uh, I have a very specific take on this. Uh, a lot of people say Jesus was quoting from Psalm 22. I say no. I say Psalm 22 is quoting from Jesus. Even though it was written a thousand years prior, I believe David was overwhelmed by God's Holy Spirit with a vision, a first-person pers vision of Jesus' death on the cross. And that he then, that is David, as a prophet, wrote down what he felt. Even though he himself didn't understand it, he simply recorded it so that a thousand plus years later, 
uh, those who had seen the crucifixion would know that this was a prophecy fulfilled. So Psalm 22 begins in Hebrew, Eli, Eli, my God, my God, Lama, which basically means for why, to what account. And then it has kind of a liaison, it kind of it slides into the next word, akfani, uh, or excuse me, um, eli, eli, lama, akfani. Uh, that first sound in the last word is similar to the last syllable of lama. And so, why have you forsaken me? This is Jesus being separated from his Father for the very first time in all of eternity because he's taken the sin guilt of all believers, past, present, and future, upon himself. And that means he has to be cut off. Now, for what remains today, I'm assuming, I want to go through the rest of Psalm 22 so that you can see that it is a first-person account of Jesus' crucifixion. Psalm 22, 1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you don't answer. By night, I, have, I find no rest. So here is the expression of the being cut off from the divine presence uh, by Jesus for the very first time in eternity. Verse 3, Yet you are holy. See, that's the reason for the being cut off. Enthroned on the praises of Israel, in you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. A statement of reality that God was the one that the Israelis successfully called upon for salvation. And that is still true even to this day. They have to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. Verse 6, But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind, despised by the people. And that should echo for you uh, Isaiah chapter 53 about the suffering servant there. It's very similar language. Now listen to these words. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. That's exactly what they were just doing uh, just a few hours before uh, when the leadership was taking uh, that role. Listen to these words. Verse 8. He trusts in he who is. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him. For he delights in him. That's the exact wording that some of those Jewish leaders had used in mockery of Jesus. Verse 9, Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust at your mother's breasts. On you I was cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Mary and Joseph raised Jesus in faith, exactly like that. Verse 11, Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. Uh, that's a poetic language for having all of these faces around you, hateful faces, bawling at you, braying at you, calling out against you, threatening you. And that's been going on for Jesus since he was arrested. Listen to these words, verse 14. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. That is definitely uh, descriptive of dying of crucifixion, uh, where you're stretched out and your own weight is pulling down on your shoulder uh, joints, your wrist and elbow joints. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. Uh, Jesus will have major cardiac heart failure 
uh, that will be expressed uh, by the water and the blood coming out uh, and when the spear is thrust in later. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. And that would be a description of dehydration, which is part of the process of dying by crucifixion. For dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They've pierced my hands and my feet. How more specific can you be than that? I can count all my bones. Uh, again, when you're stretched out uh, and the weight is pulling down on you, your ribs are going to show, especially as the more dehydrated you get through the day. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. That's very specific there, too. We know that the four soldiers on duty that day divided his main clothing into four portions, one for each of them, but they had one special piece of clothing, his, his long under tunic woven of one piece. They didn't want to tear it up. So they gambled over it. But you, O oh, he who is, do not be far off. O oh, you, my hope, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. And so the prayer for ultimate salvation. And then comes the prediction of what follows the resurrection. I will tell you, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. You who fear he who is, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but is heard, and when he, but was heard when he cried to him. And then you read the rest of that yourself. The victory that comes with the resurrection after the very prediction of the crucifixion.